As you know, I wrote a book about South Africa called The Other End of the Lifeboat. If you want to know more about that lifeboat, in terms of the provisions it has made against disaster, and the type of people who are steering it, and the kind of passengers it carries, you can read the book. But today, there are lots of people talking about South Africa itself. Some of the descriptions are highly selective, and I'll touch briefly on that. Mainly, though, I'd like to talk about the sea that surrounds the South African and American lifeboat. It's a very big sea indeed, and it's been around a long time. The travelers on that sea stretch backward in time as far as humans have been on earth. And in all that time, those travelers have been steering toward one great destination, power over all others. This struggle is now reaching a historic crest. But before we get to that, let me give you a very quick guided tour through the highlights of that struggle for power. 2,040 years ago, Caesar took a Roman army through that part of Gaul, now known as France, and conquered to what we now call the English Channel. He and his army crossed that channel and conquered the people of southern Britain. That was a great military accomplishment, and we learned his version of it in first-year Latin. He told us everything except why he did it. Why did the Roman Senate vote him the money, men, and weapons to undertake such an enormous effort? Rome didn't need more people or more land. The senators sent Caesar off on a great and expensive expedition at a time when Rome had all sorts of civil troubles at home. Why? Because southern Britain then had the largest functioning tin mines in the ancient world and tin, which is used in conjunction with bronze and iron, was a strategic metal in the manufacture of weapons and equipment. Now, let's skip ahead a couple of thousand years to an event that took place December the 7th, 1941, nearly the end of the year. Japan struck without warning at our Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor. It had, just before that, hit Britain's Pacific fleet from the air and wiped out the protection that President Roosevelt had relied upon in those waters. At the same time, the Japanese loaded entire flotillas carrying several armies and sent them down to the Dutch East Indies to French Indochina, taking English-occupied Singapore en route. Why? Japan didn't need more people at that point. It didn't need more territory. It needed rubber. Its World War I observers had reported that the Germans had to surrender because their transport stalled for lack of rubber. Tokyo reasoned that if it had rubber and we did not, we could not fight a long war, nor could our allies. The Germans were already making synthetic rubber for the same reason but we had time and space on our side. We had Britain to keep Germany busy. We were able to create from oil and chemicals a synthetic compound molded by the manufacturers of Akron into the rubber products we needed. And we needed a lot. It took a ton of rubber to make a B-52 bomber. It took rubber to make a typewriter, an automobile, a tank, Weapons and Equipment. Now, let's jump back. We're talking about several things at once, and we have to be quick. You're a serious audience, and you don't want your time wasted. But don't forget the observer who said the American...